1985, a three-part movie series premiered about an older man and a young teenager and time travel. Yes, I'm talking about Back to the Future. In this movie, if you have not yet seen it, I'm sorry if I give a spoiler, you're late. <laughs> Extremely. But in this, you've got Doc and you've got Marty McFly here. And somehow, in the midst of this relationship between Doc Brown and Marty McFly, an incident happens sending Marty accidentally back in time. He goes from 1985 back 30 years before his parents had even officially met and began dating. What happens as Marty is back in time, he learns that the past and his present and his future are intertwined. He learns that if he doesn't fix something he's already caused, his parents will never meet. In the midst of the movie, a picture begins to fade away of him and his siblings because the present that he was in and the future is being changed. Now, obviously, we're not here to talk about back to the future, as fun as that would be. I mean, come on now, we're supposed to already be flying in cars and, and have these identity things that read everything on us. They do, it's called a smartphone, but anyways, that's obviously not why we're here this morning. We're here, though, a similar thing in the fact that the past, the present, and the future are intertwined. And they affect one another. Christian, have you ever considered this? Your present, our present here, is affected by the past and what is to come in the hope of the future. And that's what our passage in Titus 2, verses 11 through 15 talk about. So if you have your Bible, I hope, invite you to go ahead and turn there to Titus 2, verses 11 through 15. Titus 2, 11 through 15 uh, please feel free to use the table of contents if you need, or if you're using one of those red pew Bibles in front of you, it is on page 1184. By chance, if you're also unfamiliar with the Bible, you would be helped to know that first reference, that two, is what we call a chapter number. It's that big number there on the page, it just identifies what chapter we're in. That second set of numbers, 11 through 15, is what we call verse numbers. There are the little numbers there on the page sets that help you. When I say, look at Titus 2, 11 with me, you know exactly where I'm talking about. So just a little help on the road map. Now as we continue, though, working our way here through the book of Titus, we've been making our way over the last several weeks through Titus with a, a short break there in between. <laughs> And looking at this letter written by the Apostle Paul to his young protege, Titus. As he's writing to Titus, he's giving him instructions of what is to be set in order in the church of Crete. He's telling them that here, here's my ministry, here's my authority. My mission is to proclaim the gospel, to tell the knowledge of truth, truth for the sake of the faith of the saints and so that they may grow in godliness. Now, you set in order so that the people here in Crete may be in order and pursue godliness. That's what we've been seeing over uh, Titus 2, 1 through 10, and the call to older men, the call to older women and younger women and younger men. They've been called to godliness. Even the elders that qualified men defined by character. What kind of character? Godliness. Godliness is shaping everything about this letter so far. That's where we're at here in Titus 2 this morning. So let's hear the word of the Lord as we pick up in Titus 2, 11 through 15. This is the word of the Lord. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no one 
disregard Jesus. Such a rich passage. Now, if I studied and rightly understand this passage then, and rightly doing this preaching thing of taking the main idea of the text and making it the main idea of the sermon, here it is. Here's that main idea. The grace of God that has appeared to us teaches us to live in the present age as we wait with hope for future glory. That's it. The grace of God that has appeared to us teaches us to live in the present age as we wait with hope for future glory. And we're going to unfold this in four points that flow just from this. Point number one, the grace of God and the past. The grace of of God and the past. Point number two, the grace of God and the present. The grace of God and the present. Point number three, the grace of God and the future. The grace of God and the future. And point number four, the grace of God and our ministry. The grace of God and our ministry. Point number one, the grace of God in the past. Look with me there again at, at Titus 2.11, like I told you was coming. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. The grace of God has already appeared. It's appeared, bringing with it salvation for all people. Now, Let's clarify something right off the bat. Paul is not arguing here in Titus 2.11 in saying that all people, including every single person, is saved. This is not arguing for universalistic faith where everyone, by the coming and appearing of Jesus, is automatically saved. This does not remove this call to faith and faith alone in Christ alone. But it's saying... Paul is saying here and saying that grace has appeared bringing salvation for all people is reemphasizing what he's just been talking about in Titus 2, 1 through 10 for the older man, the younger, the older woman, the younger, the free, the slave. It's come for all people of every kind despite their circumstance, despite even that of being Hebrew or Jew or Hebrew or Gentile. Matters not if they're American or Japanese or Iranian or Iraqi. This same gospel, this same salvation is being offered to all people as the language of the NIV uses. Salvation is being offered to all people. This is what has appeared and already been done. That is what is happening here. Particularly though, here this grace of God has appeared. It's not a concept. It's appeared in a person. The person of Christ. It is this hope that has come, this grace, this salvation that is now being brought by the coming, the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is offered now in Jesus without distinction. It's not something earned. Something given as a free gift. The very definition of grace is unmerited favor, not deserving. Friends, there is not one of us here this morning that deserves this salvation. And maybe you're here and newer to the Bible and you think, why in the world do I need salvation? Let's back up. The kids are going to learn this in EBS this week, but I'm giving you a preview. Let's back up to Genesis in the beginning. A very good God created everything by speaking it into existence. He created, and it was good. He created the heavens, the earth. He created and placed the trees. He separated the land and the waters. He separated it all. He created every beast that is. He created man in his image. And by creating man and all of his creation, it was deemed good. There was no flaw, no sin, no death. Perfectness. 
covered the earth. We were accountable to this God. He left but one rule. Do not eat of the forbidden tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what happens? The only enemy of God, a slithering serpent, slithers his way into the garden and whispers. Whispers spraying poison into the hearts of Adam and Eve. Poison to deceive them and cause them to doubt God in his goodness. God's withholding this from you. He doesn't want you to be like him. He's withholding knowledge of good and evil from you. And this lie sank into their hearts. They disobeyed and ate of the fruit of the tree. Sin enters, and so does death. Adam and Eve are cur uh, sentenced out of the garden. They are forbidden to re-enter. An angel prevents that. Sin then begins to spread through their seed. All being born in Adam and in Eve are born in sin, meaning you and I, friend, are born in our sinful nature. That same poison that took root in the hearts of Adam and Eve, our first parents, has taken root in us. We doubt God and his goodness. We reject him as king, as authoritative over us. And therefore, death continues to reign. It reigns in this world in which we live. Friends, this is what we need saved from. And yet, God's grace has appeared bringing salvation for all people. Despite our rebellion, despite our high treason against the Creator, against the King, God has made a way by sending His beloved Son to be born and laid in a manger, to live the sinless life that we couldn't because of the poison in our hearts. He even laid down his life and died in order to be the sacrificial lamb so that his blood may cleanse us. But he didn't remain dead. He rose from the grave as the victorious king and he crushed the head of the serpent. Salvation comes because of these events that have already taken place in the Lord Jesus Christ in his life, death, burial, and resurrection and even in his ascension. This is the salvation that has already appeared and been done. The question is, will we believe this news? Friend, if you're here this morning and you're one who has never believed this gospel, this good news of Jesus Christ, let me urge you this morning to see your need of a Savior, and that salvation has been made possible. It matters not where you're at. If you're 80 years old, can barely walk, or you're a four-year-old in the congregation and just learning about Jesus, salvation is possible for you if you will believe this news, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that he alone saves you from the sins of death. The sin of death. Friends, will you believe in this? But for us Christians who have already believed in this, this changes everything. Because it's already done. This salvation, this grace of God has already appeared. And it's to not only be something of the past, it changes how we live in the present and in the future. Friends, we need this grace of God at work in us. This is the grace of God that has appeared in Jesus. Point number two, the grace of God in the present. What has already come shapes how we live right now. That's Paul's point. All that he's been telling Titus to teach of this sound doctrine, to teach of his call to high character and godly living, all that he wrote about back in, in Titus 1, 1 and 2, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. All of this is rooted in this grace. This grace that has already appeared, it's all rooted in it. And, but this same grace doesn't stop 
with just saving us. It changes us here in the now, in the present. A grace that does that saves us but does not change us is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls a cheap grace. A grace that saves us but does not transform us is a cheap grace. But that's not what we see here. Verse 12. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-control, upright and godly lives in the present age. This grace that has appeared trains us now to live. It trains us. It disciplines us. It trains us not just in the sense of athletic training. It's more of like this from Proverbs 22, 6, which says, every parent should know this. Write it down if you don't know this reference. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's what the grace of God is doing. It's training us like a child, teaching us how to live and live rightly. It's teaching us in the moments of everyday life to, to be the people that we should be in Christ. It's teaching us how to act, how to respond to the grace that has already appeared in Christ. That's what this grace is disciplining us, training us. First, to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. That is, it is training us first and foremost to deny. To deny ourselves. Part of the call, call to follow Jesus, friends. A call that we often leave. If we want to make disciples the way Jesus did, we need to remember what Jesus called his followers to do. To take up a cross and to follow him. To deny ourselves. Friends, we don't make disciples that way much today. We want to say, pray this simple prayer and all's going to be better with you. Your life's going to be better. Everything's going to get easier if you just believe in this Jesus. That's a key false gospel. True gospel is this call to actually learn to deny our old self, to deny the very things of the flesh that have killed us in the first place. Look what this call, though, teaches us. It is to change us and discipline us to deny these former ways, to deny these acts of ungodliness. It disciplines those here in Crete. Look back with me to chapter 1. Look back with me to Titus 1, verse 10. Through 12. Titus 1, 10 through 12. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silent since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. To un this call to deny ungodliness is working to teach here in the church of Crete these people to deny these things. To deny being lazy gluttons. To deny their being given over to lies and being that of evil beasts that consume others. What about us, Christian? What sin still do we need to be denying in order for us to live and pursue godliness. But not just the sins themselves, even that of the thoughts. Notice again what is said back in Titus 2.12, training us or disciplining us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. It's not just the carrying out of these sins that we are to deny, it's even the very thoughts of them. We're to renew our minds, as Paul writes to the Church of Romans, in Christ, setting it on the things above. You have to deny yourselves first these worldly passions, these worldly things of ungodliness, so that we may rightly pursue Christ. Beloved, let us be killing sin. Let us be denying ourselves of the things of the flesh so that we can actually learn to live 
For these are the very things that killed us. Let's learn to live. Because that's Paul's main point here to Titus. He doesn't call them strictly to deny, simply for denial's sake, but so that they can actually live. Look again back to verse 12. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Now, if you're an English grammar nerd, you probably have already picked out on the grammar where the main verb in this sentence is. God bless you. Because you can pick it up easier than I can. I'm helped not because of the English, but because, and believe it or not, English is a complex language. Other languages actually make it easier to spot this. So when I do translation work every week to try and immerse the text, I can see the verb because it's got a certain ending. Languages are so much better than English. <laughs> but the main verb here is to live. It's not to deny. It's not to be self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. It's to live. Everything here is focusing on this call to actually learn to live in light of the grace of God that has appeared in Christ. We deny so we can live, and then to live is to live this way, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Self-control, again, here pops its head back up. If you've been paying attention as we've gone through the book of Titus, you've seen self-control over and over and over again. It appears the qualifications of the elders, it appears that for older men are to be self-controlled, Ultimately, older women are to be self-controlled because they're to teach this self-control to younger women. And what is the one thing mentioned for younger men? Self-control. Self-control is part of how we live in Christ. The book of Proverbs, again here in Proverbs 25, 28 says, A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. The Christian life without self-control it's like a city that's already been ruined by the enemy. Think about that. We don't end with self-control. We are to start with self-control. Self-control in passion. Self-control in attitude. Self-control in food we take in, the drink we take in, how we live in pursuit of sexual purity. Self-control in moments of Emotion wanting to overwhelm us, when that emotion may want to overtake us and run us to unrighteous anger, self controls to step in and to say, No, I'm going to be angry, but I'm going to respond in a godly manner, in a right, Christ like manner. This self control is to control everything and discipline us to live rightly. The self-control and this discipline even is to then call us to live upright and godly lives in the present age. To have self-control and the temptation to use business or, or to get ahead of others to, by putting others down. Is that an upright and godly life? Friend, if you are still in the workforce, guess what? Your ultimate call is not to get ahead of everyone else by whatever means. It's to live a godly life and to be a good worker, to honor Christ. That's upright and godly lives show this type of integrity. Students, this means living in self-control in the sense of your schooling and education. Something as simple as a test, not cheating on. To live upright in God's lives is, is to not try and cheat to get ahead so that you can get those good marks. It's to not be the bully and putting others down so that everyone can think much of you when the temptation arises. Friends, this call to live upright in God's lives is to flow out of what God has done for us in Christ. When we have tasted of God's gift to us in the grace of God that has come in Jesus, it changes how we live in the present. It disciplines us to live in this way. But here's the thing. It's not just changing in godliness to come. Notice again the final words here. 
upright and godly lives in the present age. God's grace is at work in the present age. Brothers, sisters, as Christians, we are tempted to think that, oh, it only gets better, and then when that day comes, we can actually live the Christian life as we're called to. We actually then begin to, to go on the assault against culture and against the world by uh, just berating them and also then trying to withdraw ourselves and isolate ourselves, thinking we can take ourselves out of this world and live in our little holy huddles. called to do. We're to live in this upright and godly lives in the present age as it is, even in its brokenness. The Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, says this. Stay calm. Sorry. Listen to this quote by Spurgeon. Society is the place in which Christianity is to exhibit the graces of Christ. You have to live soberly, godly, righteously in this world such as it is at present. It is of no use for you to scheme to escape from it. If the grace of God is in you, that grace is meant to be displayed not in a select and secluded retreat, but in this present world. You are to shine in the darkness like a light. To paraphrase another brother that I just saw this week, in God's sovereign time, call to live in the present age, this godly life is not a call to be a monk. It's a call to be immersed in the world as the light of the world. Because of the grace of God that has come to us in Jesus. Christians, let us live in this present world as a beacon of light, declaring the grace of God that has already appeared. Because that grace is not only powerful enough to save us, but to transform us and change us in the here and the now. Why? As long as to come in the future. Point number three. The grace of God and the future. The past and the present are not isolated and alone from one another. We are to live in the present in light of what has already appeared in Jesus. Because of the hope of the future that is to come. The hope of the glory of Christ. Verse 13. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now this time next week, or we will have just wrapped up a week of vacation Bible school. The kids are going to be learning during that time of creation and fall. They're going to be learning of God's promises of redemption while waiting on Thursday, they're going to see the appearing of the Savior in his first coming. And then Friday, they're going to see Jesus' death and resurrection. All of these things, as much of the start as this gives us, it's not the end. It sets us up where we're here in the fact that the grace of God has already appeared. The grace of God is working in the present. But guess what? grace of God is yet to come as well. Salvation is an already and not yet salvation. It's already one in Jesus, and yet the glory of Christ, the glory of the King, is not yet fully visible. But we're waiting for it. We're waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. As one commentator says, we're living between the two comings. We're living between the first coming and the second. We're living and waiting for the day where we can sing joy to the world. Joy to the world is not a Christmas hymn. It's a second advent, a second coming of where the king fully comes, where no more thorns infest the ground. Our king is coming to over. All. And we have the assurance of this. Our great God and Savior Christ will come in glory because he will finish what he's already began. Verse 14. 
who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Christ gave himself for us for the purpose of redeeming us in him, to make us a people of his own. That means adopting us as children. We are being adopted and made one with Christ by the Father. We are the Father's children with our fellow heir being that of Christ our King. We are His. He's purchased us by His death on the cross. And we can have certain that what He has began here in purchasing us for the purpose of redeeming us from this lawlessness to purify us, He will complete by His returning or by calling us home with him, where we will be in glory land and sin will reign no more in our mortal flesh. We will be perfect as we were created in the first place. God will restore us fully to himself. And so we see what the grace of God has done for us in Christ. It's appeared to us, it's a work changing us, and it will change us once and for all. So Christian, no matter where you're at, right here, Right now, on this third Sunday in the month of July in the year 2024, in your sanctification, you can be certain of this. Christ is still at work in those that are his. Because he will not stop until his work is completed. We will see glory. We will see his glory in his coming. We will see the glory of his full rule in ourselves and the world around us. When all things are made new again. We can have confidence in this. Brothers and sisters, this is the grace of God that has come to us, is at work in us, and will come. But now what? And number four, the grace of God in our ministry. Because of this past appearing of God's grace, the present discipline of God's grace in our lives, and future glory of God's grace, we, beloved brothers and sisters, are to be a people who declare these things boldly. The world and the world who needs our aid. Verse 15. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, this means we are to be continually declaring these things to one another. Reminding one another whether we are already Christians on both sides of that reminder and encouraging to keep pressing on as the day draws near. As hardship said in reminding each other of the discipline and the grace of God at work in us. Whether it's telling our children or a neighbor or a colleague or a mere acquaintance in a grocery store. We're to keep proclaiming the glory of Christ so that others may hear. Let us not di be disregarded because of this, because the world is going to think we're crazy as we declare these things, and that's okay. Amen. Let the world think we're crazy, because, brothers and sisters, this is the grace of God that has come, and that the world needs to hear. And if we're thought to be a little crazy in declaring it, that's fine. Let us declare so that others may hear and taste of this grace of God. But also then for, for me primarily as the primary preacher and teacher in this local church, me and my fellow elders then must labor above all to declare these things and exhorting and rebuking with all authority. Not our authority, the gospels, the word of God's authority teaching these things, what it means to live the Christian life. That means drawing some hard lines sometimes. Brothers and sisters, there will be times where somebody's going to come and say, I want to be baptized, and we have to, with this authority, exhort and rebuke, say, no, you have not yet tasted the grace of God because you don't even know what you're professing to believe. And that's a hard thing. And yet we're to do this work. We're to declare these things because the grace of God changes people. There's to be evident through, look back again at verse 14. All lawlessness and purified for himself and people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. 
I mean, if you're here this morning and you profess to be a believer, and yet there is no evidence of this change of the swelling of grace wanting to change you and produce these good works in you, guess what? You do not yet taste of the grace of God. Now again, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone to the glory of God alone. But because of that grace, because it's no cheap grace, it changes us. It transforms us. It produces these good works. The good works that Paul is telling here, this zealous for good works, is the overflow of grace in our lives. Therefore, we must declare and exhort and rebuke in these ways. Sometimes giving hard warnings and giving exhortation and the Christian keep pressing on because this is what God's game plan for you is. This is the roadmap to faithful Christian living to see these good works in grace. To see you produce godliness. To walk in more and more godliness. No, we will not be perfected until glory land. But brothers and sisters, we sure as heck better be striving for it right here, right now. Why? Because the grace of God is to be at work in us. That means it's not a call to be lackadaisical in the Christian life. It's to continue to see what Christ has already done and that to be constantly transforming us, constantly calling us up. Brothers and sisters, let us see this grace of God and let us taste it and let it continue to be at work transforming us as we set our eyes towards the grace of God to come and the return of our kingdom. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your grace to us in Jesus. We thank you for the grace that has come, and we pray, Lord, this morning for any here who is yet to believe, Lord, for them to repent and do so today. But Lord, for us as Christians, God, we pray. Lord, let this grace of God continue to discipline us, to train us, so that we may walk in godliness more and more with each day, encouraging one another and rebuking and exhorting where we need, so that we all may stand mature in our mutual faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray and we ask this in Jesus' name.